Hey, good morning, everybody. How we doing? Happy Easter to all of you. So great to see you. If you're a guest, we just want to again warmly welcome you. My name is Dave Melendez. I get to serve here as the lead pastor. Great to have you guys with us. I want to welcome all of our friends joining us online as well. You know, Easter is awesome. It's just a great celebration. It's a wonderful time just to, if you're kind of a person kicking the tires, looking around, trying to find a church, haven't really connected anywhere, uh, we hope you just consider this a, as just kind of a first taste. And if you're looking for a church home, we'd love to see you back with us uh, next Sunday. I uh, want to let you know that we are a church, if you are new, we're a church who teaches through the Bible verse by verse. Our, our desire is is to actually help people understand the Bible. And so this is a great time for you to jump on board because next Sunday we're starting on the first book of the Bible. We're going to start a study of the book of Genesis. So it's a great place to start, first book of, of the Scripture. And so we'd love to have you guys join us next Sunday uh, in same service times, 9 o'clock and 1030. Hey, go ahead and take that outline out of your, your worship guide. There's a place where you can kind of follow along with some of the thoughts uh, and the points that I'm going to be sharing with you today. You know, as we're celebrating Easter, I think it's pretty clear that Easter has become kind of a secularized commercial holiday here in America. There's a lot of emphasis on uh, Easter bunny and eggs and candy and the like. Now, I'm not criticizing those who enjoy that, and we have Easter egg hunts with our kids and have had a great time with all that, uh, but I'm just trying to make the point that Easter has become the third largest commercial holiday in America, third only behind Mother's Day and Christmas in terms of money spent on these particular days. So things have kind of become a little more secularized. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when spring break was called Easter break. How many of you remember that, like a long time ago? See, all these people were back in the Civil War. You guys fought in, <laughs> fought in the Civil War with me, right? That was a long time ago. Uh, but Easter had slowly shifted from a spiritual emphasis to a secular emphasis. But we just need to be clear. The real meaning of Easter is celebrating what happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus was nailed to a Roman cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead. And today, we join tens of millions of people across this planet celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is what distinguishes Christian faith from every other world religion. No other world leader of any world religion has ever professed to have risen from the dead. Only Jesus. Not Buddha, not Gandhi, not Confucius, not Krishna, not Muhammad, not L. Ron Hubbard. All right, none of them have professed to have risen from the dead. Only Jesus. Great men and women in history have come and gone, but every single one of them still occupy a grave somewhere. But Jesus walked out of the grave. And he's alive today. If you believe that, put your hands together. Come on, let's just thank God for that truth. Now, there's some uh, interesting website that kind of documents gravestones, uh, little epitaphs, messages that people have put on their gravestones uh, when they die. Some of them are kind of funny and interesting. I thought this guy obviously had a very great sense of humor. Here lies John Yeast. Pardon me for not rising, he puts on his. Uh, the next one is for those who are just kind of a, a man or a woman of few words. Just straight to the point, really simple. How about this one? 
<laughs> peace out, right? Uh, now, this next one, you, you kind of have to know Spanish a little bit. I'll do my best to interpret. Uh, but this guy, they have this little thought there at the bottom. Buen esposo, buen padre, mal electricita, cancero. Now, if you don't speak Spanish, what that means is he was a good husband, a good father, and a bad electrician. <laughs> uh, so apparently it didn't go so well for him, the last little project he took on. If you go to Jerusalem today, there's a grave that's considered to be the place where Jesus was buried, where he was laid for three days before he arose. And in this place, of course, people come from all over the world to visit that garden tomb. And on the garden tomb, they put a wooden door. And on, on the door, there's actually a sign, which is kind of an epitaph, a perfect one for Jesus. He is not here, for he is risen. And that statement, that epitaph, is straight from the Bible. And what we're going to do today is read three of the key passages, short passages, related to the resurrection of Jesus Christ today, uh, from Matthew and from John. We'll have the uh, verses up here on the screen for you. If you want to just follow along with me, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 6. How many of you like the way those kids summarize the story? Wasn't that great? All right, you're going to see some similarities here. Uh, after the Sabbath, at the dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Next passage in the book of John, chapter 20, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Original language says he basically appeared right there among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now we go forward a little bit in, in John 20. A week later, his disciples were again together, and Thomas was with them this time. Apparently, Thomas was not there the first time that Jesus appeared. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, I heard a story about a little 10-year-old boy who went into a barber shop. The owner of the barber shop was coming, cutting some guy's hair and he leaned down to his client. He said, hey, listen, see this little kid who walked into the to shop? He's the dumbest kid you've ever seen. Matter of fact, I'll prove it to you. So he calls the kid over, and he says, hey, listen, kid, make your choice. And he puts in one hand a dollar bill, and the other hand, he has 50 cents. He says, kid, you can have either one you want. Take your pick. And the kid looks at both hands. He takes the 50 cents, and he goes out the door. The owner starts laughing. He says to the client, see, I told you this kid was dumb. He falls for it every time. Well, finishes cutting in his hair. The client walks out, and he sees the little kid walking out of an ice cream shop across the street. And so he goes over to the little kid, and he says, little, hey, dude, why, I'm just curious. Why did you take the 50 cents instead of the dollar? And the little kid licked his ice cream cone one time, and he said, the day I take the dollar, the game is over. Apparently, this has happened a few times. So that kid was not so dumb after all. He knew exactly what he was doing. You know, there are people who think 
Christians are dumb for believing in the resurrection. They believe Christians are just believing in fairy tales to believe such a ridiculous truth. But I have news for you. We know exactly what we're doing. We know and have experienced the truth of the resurrected Christ in our lives. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I don't know if you know this, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ is actually one of the most well-documented events in history. Dr. Simon Greenleaf, who helped develop the Harvard Law School back in the 1800s, actually said this. It's a very powerful statement considering the source. He said, according to the laws of legal evidence used in courts of law, there is more evidence for the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than just about any other event in recorded history. It's pretty powerful. Again, considering the source. If you have your notes there, if you're looking at the outline, I just want to show you and just review three evidences of Christ's resurrection. If you want to kind of follow along with them, the first evidence that we can have is the eyewitnesses in the Bible. Now, the Bible has long been considered an accurate historical document. Those who are experts in the field of archaeology recognize how accurate the Bible is when it comes to names and places and different events that time after time, when they do these archaeological digs, they find facts and evidence verifying the Bible over and over again. So experts in that field recognize the historic and accurate expression of history that is contained in the Bible. And what we see in the Bible as an accurate record of history are recorded eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection. Mary Magdalene, John chapter 20, which we read, Mary went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. This is an eyewitness account. And she told them all the things that Jesus said to her. The Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, he says, God has raised Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it. Then, of course, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, Paul says, he appeared to me. So we have documented eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection recorded in the Bible. But we also don't have to just rely on that. For those who don't believe in the authority of the Bible, we also have historical accounts outside the Bible. There are 39 other ancient historical sources from the first and second centuries, I mean right after this period of the events of Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Historians like Josephus and Tacitus and Suetonius and Justin Martyr and Ignatius and Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria and others, all of whom document historical evidence of Jesus' life, his miracles, his death, and his resurrection. But then we also have a third factor, which is the blood of the martyrs. People who have died for their profession of their faith in Jesus Christ, that he is the risen Lord. And the fact is, there are people who will die and choose to die for something that is true, but Nobody's going to die for something that they know is a lie. But ten of the twelve apostles laid down their lives, and not one of them recanted and denied their witness of seeing the risen Lord. You know, human nature, again, just gives some evidence to the truth of the eyewitness accounts. A guy named uh, Chuck Colson, I don't know if you know who know he, he is, but he was back embroiled in the Watergate scandal with President Nixon back years ago. And a bunch of people went to prison. He was one of the co-conspirators and all that. Chuck Colson went to prison. But while he was in prison, he came to faith in Christ and afterwards lived a very powerful testimony for Jesus Christ. Listen to this quote from him. 
He says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead and proclaimed that truth for over 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured this if it were not true. Watergate involved 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles kept a lie for 40 years. Many of them lost their lives for the lie. Absolutely impossible. We have this powerful testimony of those who are willing to give their lives for the truth. I don't know if you know this, but over 70 million Christians throughout history have given their lives for the profession of their faith. In fact, over 1 million have been martyred just in the past 10 years. On average, one Christian dies standing up for their faith every six minutes. That means that since this service started, five to six people, Christians around the world, have lost their lives for their profession of Jesus Christ. Think about this. Not only is the resurrection of Jesus the most well-documented event in history, but it's also the most disputed. Let's just be honest. Why is it? Why is it that people dispute this? It's because there were only a few hundred people back at the time who actually were eyewitnesses, who actually saw Jesus die and then saw him in his resurrection body appearing to them right before their eyes. There's only a few hundred people who actually saw it for themselves. And if you didn't see it for yourself, it sounds like quite the tall tale. It's extraordinary. How could I possibly believe something like that? And it's interesting. Even though there's evidence, people have a tendency to not believe things, even when there's evidence there, because they're just not going to believe it unless they see it themselves. This is kind of typical. Uh, Human beings just have this tendency. Uh, Just as an example, how many of you believe that the United States sent men to the moon, and they walked on the moon, and they came back. How many of you believe that that actually happened? Okay. Did you know that there's a big segment of people, conspiracy theorists, who believe that that was all faked? They believe that uh, it was just a conspiracy between the government and Hollywood, and it never happened. Despite all the evidence, despite everything in front of them, they choose not to believe it. That's just human nature. Now, I've, before we moved here to Auburndale, we lived in Huntsville, Alabama, and I met many of the engineers there at Redstone Arsenal who worked on the Apollo missions and all that. I can assure you that it did actually happen. But there are people who won't believe it, regardless of what you tell them, despite all the evidence. How many of you believe the earth is round? Let me see your hand. Okay. Did you know that there is a flat earth society? They're a group of people who have come together and they are absolutely convinced that world is flat. And they have very interesting theories and very interesting opinions and and arguments for, for proposing that the earth is flat. They just won't believe all of the evidence to the contrary. Now, how many of you believe that Elvis has passed on and he is dead? How many believe that? Did you know there are people who do not believe Elvis is dead? I saw him in Publix. I saw him at the beach. I saw him wherever. Despite all the facts and the evidence and the eyewitnesses, they just can't and won't believe it. This is not uncommon for human beings to do. I hope you believe that men did go to the moon and come back. I hope you believe that the earth is round. I hope you believe that Elvis is dead. God bless his soul. You can believe those things even though you didn't actually see it for yourself. You look at the evidence, you can listen to the eyewitness, you can uh, validate their credibility, and then you can exercise intelligent thought based on the data and choose to trust that those particular things happened. See, Jesus knew That thousands of years after his resurrection, there would be people like us who would have a hard time believing it. And we'd struggle with doubt. And it's like, man, that just sounds preposterous. Because we weren't there. We didn't see him risen from the dead. And it's interesting 
that Jesus, when Thomas was doubting, and he says, Thomas, just touch my hands. See, it's me. And Thomas is overwhelmed, and he, he professes his faith in Jesus and celebrates him. Jesus says, Thomas, I bless you for believing, even though you've seen me. But then he says, I also want to bless those who believe, who will not ever see. Those people in the future. Jesus was talking about us. Those who would believe and have not seen. This is so important, everybody, because there's a day coming where every single one of us are going to stand before God. Statistics say 10 out of 10 people die at some point. Even Elvis, all right? It's, it's coming for all of us. But there is a life beyond this life. This is not all there is. And the Bible makes it really clear that we're all going to stand before God. And when we stand before God, we will need a Savior. Jesus provided the way for sinful people to stand before a perfectly holy God. This is why the first thing Jesus says when he appears to his disciples after his resurrection, he says, peace be with you. He knew that mankind's greatest need was peace with God. And you can't have peace with God without faith in what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. In fact, Jesus said this three different times, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you after his resurrection. It's through faith in Jesus and what he did that that separation, our sin that separates us and God, that, that, that separation is removed. Guilt is removed. Condemnation is removed. Now, without faith in Jesus... We're condemned already. We're already under the judgment of God. We are literally, every human being who has not trusted in their, their, put their faith in Jesus Christ is literally on the highway to hell. That's where we're going. But Jesus interrupted that plan and he has provided a way for us to experience peace with God and forgiveness from God. So the really important question for us to consider today is do you have God's peace in your life? Do you know that you're right with God? Do you know that you're going to heaven? Now, there are a lot of people who just kind of assume they're going to heaven because, hey, I'm a good person. You know, I love my family. I'm a good neighbor. I'm not as bad as those people, you know, those ax murderers and those terrible criminals. I'm not like them. So certainly I've got enough brownie points. I'm okay. I'm going to be all right with God when I get there. But here's the problem. God will not grade us. When we stand before him, he will not grade us on a curve. He's not going to choose to accept or reject us based on how well we live compared to other people. We are going to be put against the standard of God's absolute perfect holiness. That's the standard. How many of you would agree that if the standard is absolute perfection, we're all in really big trouble? We are. But that's why Jesus came. Because we're all sinners. We're all guilty. We're none righteous. We, we all deserve and are destined for judgment from a holy God. But that's why Jesus went to the cross. To pay the penalty for our sins. To experience judgment so that we would not have to experience judgment for sin. It's a great passage here that just summarizes the, summarizes the entire message of the gospel. I wonder if we can just read this out loud together. Everybody from the screen, come on, nice and loud in your outside voices. Come on, let's read it. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when we believe what Jesus Christ did for us, we receive this gift of salvation. And this is what gives us peace with God. When we talk about having peace with God, is that hostility, that rebellion that we have towards God, resisting him, that hostility is removed. We accept what he did for us. We submit to his authority. We say, Lord, you're the creator. I'm the creation. I submit to you in my life. That's what we mean when we talk about making Jesus Christ Savior and Lord. We receive his forgiveness and we come under his authority. This is how we have peace with God. Only then, when we have peace with God, are we ever going to have peace with ourselves. You know, people today, the vast majority, lack inner peace. 
in constant turmoil, constantly running after things, looking for things to fill that void in their heart. People are self-medicating. People are destroying themselves with life-controlling habits and addictions. People running from relationship to relationship, all kinds of damage in, in families and dysfunction, all because we're not at peace with ourselves and we can never be until we are at peace with God. When we're at peace with God, we can be at peace with ourselves. Then we can then be at peace with others. Only then. You're never going to be at peace with others until you take care of it with God and you take care of it on the inside. That's when you have the ability to have healthy relationships with your spouse, with your family, with your friends. The ability to ask for forgiveness when you realize you messed up. The ability to forgive others when they hurt you. You have the capacity of love that comes from God. Once I'm a forgiven person, I have the ability to forgive and the ability to love the way God loves. So it starts with peace with God. It then extends to peace with ourselves, and then we can have peace with others. It only happens through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the hope of the world. Now, three days ago, April 14th, was the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. 110 years ago, three days ago, was the day this tragic voyage took place where over 2,000 passengers got on what was considered to be the largest uh, seagoing vessel in the world at that time. And they're going to cross the Atlantic. 2,000 passengers signed up, over 2,000. They hit an iceberg, the ship went down, and only 700, a little over 700, survived when the Titanic sank. When news got back to England that uh, this tragedy took place, family members, friends of those who they knew were on the ship flocked to this warehouse in Liverpool, England, to find out the status of their loved ones. Back then, obviously, word traveled much slower, news traveled very, very slow, and so there was this agonizingly long process of them looking at this huge blackboard in the warehouse. And there on the blackboard, there were two columns, known to be lost and known to be saved. People had to wait hours and days for their family member or loved one to have their names added to that blackboard in one of those two columns. Interestingly enough, on the Titanic, there were actually three classes of passengers. First class, which were the extremely wealthy people, champagne and caviar and luxury suites. Second class, which is kind of middle of the road, pretty nice. Third class, here's a mat, here's a place on the floor, hang out, we'll get you to the other side of the Atlantic. Three different classes. But in the end, in the end, there were only two columns. Those who were lost, and those who are saved. This is how it is with every single one of us spiritually. When we stand before God, there will be no classes in the way human beings are segmented today. There'll be no ethnic classes. There'll be no socioeconomic classes. There'll be no educational classes, different levels of social status. Only two categories, lost or saved. And God's invitation to us is to experience what Jesus purchased for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And we receive it by faith. Here's what the scripture says. It's very simple. Acts 2.21. Everyone, everybody say everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, religious people tend to have a problem with this verse because there's not more than, it's more than just calling on the name of the Lord. Hey, are you a church member? Have you been baptized? Have you jumped through all of our requirements for you to be considered a truly authentic Christian? But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. When I read that verse, I think about that thief on the cross. You know, Jesus, he hung there on the cross. On either side of him were two criminals. Early on in the crucifixion experience, 
both of those criminals were mocking Jesus and hurling insults at Jesus and, and, and cursing him. But at some point, something happened in the heart of one of those criminals. Surely it was because of the words that Jesus spoke, those seven statements of grace and power and authority and forgiveness. Had they ever seen anybody in that excruciating pain say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Something happened in the heart of one of those criminals and he speaks to Jesus and says, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. That's all he said. How did Jesus reply to him? He said, surely, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's all it took. I would love to find that criminal in heaven one day. Say, dude, do you have, how did this work? How did you work this out there on the cross? How did you, how are you even in heaven? I'd probably say, I don't know. You know what his answer would be probably? The guy on the middle cross said I could come. That's all it took. Something in his heart. This is a heart issue. Do you believe have you surrendered your life to the authority of Jesus Christ? No one can do that for you. Here at Berkeley Chapel, we do not pressure people, manipulate people. I'm going to close this service now and give you an opportunity to express your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe upon him. But I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to have you raise your hand. I'm not going to have you say certain words. I'm not going to call you up to the front or anything like that. But here's the deal. God sees your heart. He knows your heart. Some of you, God's been speaking to you for many weeks, many months, many years, leading you to this moment of surrender to him. Today, I want to invite you. I can think of no better day than Easter Sunday to say, Lord, I put my faith in you as Savior and my Lord. So can we just bow our heads right now, everybody, all across this room as we pray?